great to be here tonight and I'd like to start this evening's session by asking you to participate in a very scientific survey for me, if you don't mind. I'm going to put up on the slides a bunch of pictures and I'd like you to take a moment to look at them and think to yourself on a Monday morning on your way to work once you're at work early in the day, do you ever look like anybody or maybe multiple people that appear in these pictures? And if you do, please please raise your hand so I can take a poll. <laughs> <laughs> Got some shy hands, but I'd say maybe about a quarter of the room. So thank you for your participation. The reason I ask if any of you look like this on a Monday morning is because these people look to me like they're engaged employees. And Gallup defines an engaged employee as one who's emotionally connected to their work and deeply invested in their company's future. And I think for us all, that's our desired end state in our career. We want to go to work on a Monday morning and maybe give ourselves just a little fist pump. Yes, TGIM, thank goodness it's Monday. I'm excited about what the week holds ahead of me. I'm excited to make an impact, to see my colleagues, and to do great things for our clients. <coughs> And so why I bring this up is because we're going to talk about how taking a strengths-based approach to our career will help us to get to this state where we all raise our hands in response to a slide like the one before. Today's agenda is going to cover four main things. I'm going to start by talking a bit about the New Zealand workplace and engagement. Then I'm going to introduce you to talents and strengths, and we've got some exercises, so I'm really looking forward to having you all be involved and hopefully enjoy those. Then step three will be a bit of a micro approach. I'm going to give you some steps and tools so that you can use strengths every day. And finally, we're going to go up a level and think about how can we take a strengths-based approach to our career. So I hope that sounds like a good plan to you all, and we'll start by talking some statistics <coughs> about the New Zealand workplace. So actually, when I did the scientific poll in the room, and I said about a quarter of you uh, seem to be engaged employees, that's, that's pretty much right on, because Gallup statistics show that 77% of New Zealand employees are not engaged at work. Now, what does this mean? It might not be as depressing as it sounds. So we classify people into three groups. So we've got the engaged people who raise their hand in response to that question. These are people who get excited about coming to work. They're very committed to their organisations and they look a little bit like owners of a business. The bulk of people in New Zealand, these are New Zealand statistics, but most of the world looks pretty similar. We're not particularly uh, better or worse than most other countries. So we have 62% of people sitting in this middle, not engaged bucket. And these people may well be quite productive employees. They may be very competent, but they're not psychologically connected to their companies and to their jobs. So these people are people that perhaps are clocking in and clocking out, working nine to five, maybe reading a bit of the New Zealand Herald, trying to pass the time. But you wouldn't look at them and say these are overly awful employees. This is the bulk of the New Zealand workforce. People who are doing a fairly good job but not overly excited or connected to their job and their organisation. And then a fairly large group we call actively disengaged. These are people who are at work but they're not really present. They're pretty unhappy with their job and the company that they work for. And not only are they unhappy inside themselves, but they often insist on spreading their unhappiness to other people who may well sit in the engaged or not engaged buckets. So actually in New Zealand, the majority of people look quite worse. <laughs> Thank goodness. It's Friday, um, 
you know, as I said, maybe people who, who are doing their jobs competently, uh, people who are showing up but not really showing up to work. And then, of course, these people who are so unhappy with their work that it's, it's having a negative impact on their colleagues. In terms of what does work look like if 77% of our population are not engaged, we see things like this. Maybe people <laughs> not taking the initiative that they should in their job. The job is done, but perhaps not as well as, it, as what it could be. Quality, quality issues. <coughs> and then of course, as I've mentioned, people... <laughs> We want to make sure that everybody else at work or on their way to work is not having a good time. <laughs> so why are most of us not engaged in our work? I think about this often because we spend most of our waking life at work. So it's a little bit sad that most of us aren't engaged. And I think there are a couple of reasons. First of all, there's always an opportunity for us to have better managers because the manager influences about 70% of our engagement. But for almost all of us, we don't really have the opportunity to pick our manager. That's kind of something that gets given to you when you join an organisation. <coughs> So thinking about what types of things are in our sphere of influence um, that can help us to be more engaged in our work led me to develop this presentation for you all today. So I've brought you all pads and pens and as I'm sure you've all figured out, one side of the pen is a pen and the other side is a highlighter so we'll be using both. I'd like you to help me with a bit of an exercise. How many of you are parents? Quite a, quite a good number. So if you're not a parent, perhaps you can think back to when you were a child at secondary school or even when you were at university and you came home at the end of the term or semester with your report card. So pretend your child, or if you don't have a child, you as a child returns home with the following marks on the report card. A's in English and Social Studies, a C in Science, just getting by in Science, and a D or a failing grade in Maths. On your piece of paper, just to yourself, would you mind writing down which of these marks you'd spend the most time discussing with your son or daughter? <laughs> polling and surveying, so unsurprisingly, we asked this question to a group of parents. And I'd love to have some audience guesses from the options up here on the screen. What percentage of parents said they would spend most of the time focusing on the D or the failing grade that their child brought home on their report card? Is it 60? 60? 70. Yeah, you guys are right. So 77%. So more than more than three quarters of parents would spend the most time talking to their child about the area they were failing really bad at. So 77%. More than three quarters of parents would spend the most time focusing on the area that their child was failing at. Because from the cradle to the cubicle, we devote more time to our shortcomings than to our strengths. But Gallup has discovered that when people have the opportunity to use their strengths every day, they're six times more likely to be engaged in their work, so to be uh, psychologically committed and emotionally connected to their job and their career, and three times more likely to say they have an excellent quality of life or good well-being. So this leads me to the second section where we're going to talk in depth about talents and strengths. But I'd like to start talking about this section in an odd place by addressing weaknesses. 
because particularly as New Zealanders, we like to talk about weaknesses and the things that we're not very good at. So with me, positivity is one of my top strengths, so I like to get this out of the way so we can talk about more uplifting things for the rest of our discussion this evening. So a weakness isn't simply something that you're bad at. A weakness is something that gets in the way of your success. So for me, I'm a terrible swimmer. I always have been. And even though my parents tried to bribe me with McDonald's, I never got any better at swimming. But fortunately, my job never involves swimming. So this is something that's not a weakness for me. However, if I was weak in communication and I got really frightened uh, going to client meetings and talking to people, as for most other people in their work, this would be a weakness. So we often think about things when people say, what are your weaknesses? A whole laundry list of things that you're bad at. It's only a weakness if it gets in the way of your job and your performance. A few strategies for overcoming a weakness so that we can focus on our strengths. If you don't have to do it, don't do it and ignore it. Secondly, get just good enough. So maybe it's not an option for your child to get a D in maths. Maybe they need to focus enough attention so that they get a C and so that they're passing. But they don't really need to spend all of their time on it because you know they're probably never going to be an A plus maths student. Now I will also share all my slides with you if you don't want to write everything down. So in the workplace in particular, you can form a complementary partnership. So if there's something that you're already good at and somebody else is not good at, invite vice versa. Look to form a partnership with somebody because unsurprisingly, the things that we're good at, we really like doing. Develop a system structure or process or finally overwhelm it with a strength. I want to tell you a bit of a, a sports story about a, a golfer that you will all probably have heard of called Tiger Woods. He was interviewed a few years ago by a sports journalist who asked him what he thought his weaknesses were in his golf game. And Tiger Woods said, well, I'm not going to reveal that for my competitors to, to know. Um, so the sports reporter decided to guess at what his weakness is based on years of studying his game. He said, I think your weakness is getting out of the sand. I can imagine that you must spend a lot of hours practicing getting out of the sand because that's your main area where you can improve. And Tiger Woods said, actually, no, I spend very little time focusing on getting out of the sand, practicing in the sand. I spend most of my time focusing on my drives and my putts so I don't get into the sand in the first place. And this is a perfect example of taking what you're good at, building on those things so you're exceptional, and therefore not really having to do what you're weak at at all, or rarely, because you've overwhelmed it with the strength. I hope that makes sense. Now Gallup has been researching people and strengths since the 1950s and 60s. And Dr. Donald Clifton, one of our psychologists, did a bunch of research. And what he noticed was that in the 50s and 60s, there were thousands of articles and publications on what was wrong with people, things like mental illnesses and the other ways that people got themselves into trouble. But only a handful of publications and academic articles on what was right with people. And so he said this, what will happen when we think about what's right with people rather than fixating on what's wrong with them? And from this, Gallup's strengths-based approach was born. I'd like to ask you to participate in another activity with me, if you're willing. Would you please raise your hand if you always, or almost always, talk to people pretty much wherever you go, in the elevator, the supermarket? <laughs> Great, right, there's a lot of you. What about if you all 
always or almost always gravitate towards a familiar face at a big party. What about if you have a colour coded or otherwise organised wardrobe? It's a smaller, smaller group for you. Please raise your hand if you always or almost always <laughs> 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 to the reminder that it's there. <coughs> what about if you take a long time to make decisions? If you ask too many questions or you've been told by somebody that you ask too many. if you write down a list of things to do and you stick to it. And sometimes you'll do something that's not on your list and go back and write it on your list. <laughs> 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 Anything. 
and that each person's greatest room for growth is in his or her areas of greatest weakness. It's a very logical thing to think. Our greatest room for improvement is the D in maths, because we can go from a D to an A. I'd like you on your pads for me to please do a bit of a writing exercise. I will time you for 30 seconds, and I'd just like you to see how many times you can write down uh, alumni event for me. Um, but Write it with your non-dominant hand and see how we go. Okay. Go.
decades. And around the world, using our tool called the Clifton Strengths Finder tool, developed by Dr. Donald Clifton. And by the way, this isn't the only strengths tool. There are other tools out there that you can use to discover your strengths. Or in fact, you don't even necessarily need a tool to discover your strengths. You can just be reflective and think back on your career and come up with what you think they might be. 15 million people know their strengths through our tool. And really interestingly for me, New Zealand, per head of population, has the most strengths takers of any country in the world. So we're actually right into it. In the States, most of the Fortune 500 companies use this tool. And it comes in the form of a book, but you can also take the assessment online. But we like to say that this isn't just just a book, this is about a movement. This is a strengths-based movement. What our, our strengths assessment does is it measures a person's natural talents within 34 themes of talents across four domains. And so these are the four domains with all of the strengths in the buckets. And what I've hidden for you underneath your hands is a list of these 34 strengths in alphabetical order. And they're colour coded for the four domains. So I'd love for you to just take a few minutes to read through if you've never really thought about putting a language to your strengths and see what leaps out at you. As, as things that you really think are your strengths and you're welcome to use the highlighter at the end of your pen um, if you see something that leaps out. See if you can pick out a few. So I've seen a bit of furious highlighting. Who's picked up something that they think is definitely them. And what, what have you what have you found that I might share? Things like context. I'm always looking to look at the context of yep. things. Um, developer. Deliberative. Although um, I do tend to some people think I rush into things, but I do actually deliberate in my own way. Yep. Great. And those are not particularly common strengths as well, which makes it a little more unique. Anybody else want to share what they, anything that leapt out strongly for them? Uh, bucket 
it's covered, but you need not worry if all of your strengths, if all of your top five strengths fall into one or two buckets, that's quite common. Now for those of you who like statistics and are thinking, you know, the strength stuff, it sounds good, but what does it mean for my performance or for the bottom line of the business? <coughs> so we've, we've studied this, and this is our statistics for the individual level, we also have this for the company level. But when compared to their peers, employees who receive strengths-based development were found to have a variety of improved performance outcomes in a range, so 8 to 18% increased performance, which is based on performance ratings, productivity, sales data, 2 to 10% higher customer metrics, 20 to 73% lower attrition, which is turnover, higher employee engagement, which we've talked about, and between 4 and 10% increased citizenship, which basically means participation in extracurricular company activities. So strengths really does make a difference for performance and you also saw that in the speed reading exercise. And just to explain why there's a range on that slide is because you can have a variety of strengths interventions. So you can do a strengths assessment to discover your strengths and that will make some difference to how you perform at work. So in this case, if you take the Clifton Strengths Finder Strengths Assessment, you'll be about 20% less turnover with your staff, 20% less likely to, to leave your job within that year. But for organisations where they created a strengths-based culture, which will be taking an assessment, uh, investing in coaching, having the managers have strengths education, so they're developing employees based on their strengths rather than pointing out what's wrong with them and having them focus on their weaknesses. And team strength sessions, so getting an understanding of where everybody sits in the team and knowing where their strengths fall into the four buckets. We can expect 73% of this attrition. But overall, the point from the last slide is that strengths is not just something that's nice to do. I mean, it's lovely to talk about it. It's great to present on it. Everybody loves strengths. But it really makes a difference to our lives as employees and to the companies that we work for. So to what I promised, three easy steps, very simple, not rocket science. How can we use our strengths every day? First of all, we need to identify what they are. Then we need to really understand them and accept that they're unique. So I might have context as a strength, is that Philip? Yes. Has context as a strength, but context looks very different between the two of us. So what's unique to you? You need to understand what it means in terms of your role, in terms of your life, your experiences. And of course, I have context, but I also have strategic. Philip has context and he has deliberative. And because of the way his strengths mix together, and the way my strengths mix together, the outcome will look very different. So once we know what they are, we've spent time understanding them, might be helpful to talk to your colleagues or to your spouse because sometimes we look at our strengths when, we, when we've taken an assessment and we say, oh, this doesn't sound like me, but we ask the people that we work with and we live with and they say, that's totally you. They just have a very different perspective on you than you do. And thirdly, keep them top of mind. So we don't want to go to the energy of discovering them and diving, diving deep and really understanding them, only to put them in the drawer. So at Gallup, we have our strengths and our email signatures and on our desks and on, on our doors. And it's an important part of how we interact with one another. So that on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm thinking, how can I use my strengths as I approach this task? So for our final section, and this section builds on section three, so we already know what our strengths are, we understand them, they're top of mind, so we're familiar with our strengths. 
how might we take a strengths-based approach to our career? So I've got some different suggestions depending on what part of your career you might be in. <coughs> so earlier in your career, if you're thinking about your first job, select a role that will allow you to utilise your strengths every day and really call upon you to use your weaknesses. So think of it Tiger Woods if you can. If I'm a person who loves relationship building and communicating, reading a job description for an analyst role that says I'll be in Microsoft Excel all day alone is not going to fulfill you. Because <coughs> if we look at a job description and think that we can utilise our strengths every day in this role. <coughs> I don't have to use my weaknesses, which I know <coughs> right off my non dominant hand is really exhausting and draining. Then this will help to position you to maximise your opportunity for success, not only for enjoyment and fulfilment in your role, but also to be really great at what you do. Everybody loves to feel great at what they do. We all want to be successful. If you're already into your career, but you're considering a career change, looking at a card and picking out your strengths or taking an assessment might not be enough for you. So what I propose is that you look back on your career and think about the moments, and they might just be small moments in your career when you were most energized and productive, and ask yourself specifically, what were you doing? And then look at your strengths profile and see what marries up. What strengths were you drawing on when you felt really energised and engaged? And maybe it was something you only had an opportunity to do for 5% of your job. And that's why you want to leave and change your career. So once you've figured out what strengths you were drawing on, what skills you were using that made you feel most energised, figure out how you can do more of that. <coughs> if you're thinking that you've already identified the field that you want to work in and you're, you're okay with that, you're not thinking about career change, but you're thinking about a company change, what you want to be looking for is a future employer that you have a cultural and values alignment with. Do they follow a strengths-based development approach or a weakness-fixing approach? A lot of companies in New Zealand are starting to develop their employees based on strengths. So, my brother uh, recently was interviewing for his first role as a solicitor, and he interviewed with a lot of different um, law firms in Auckland, and one of the questions that he got um, all the time to Mel's introductory point was tell me what your weaknesses are. This is um, a question that depresses me because it came up more than once. This is probably not the type of company that you want to work for if you really buy into um, following a strengths based approach and want to develop yourself based on strengths. So look, look for an organisation that, that really understands that people can be their best and, re and reach their highest potential by focusing on what they're good at, not identifying their weaknesses and talking about them and trying to become competent at your weaknesses. When looking to improve engagement in your current role, look to form complementary partnerships, as I touched on earlier, or become part of a team where you can make each other more successful by all contributing in your area of greater strength. And you'll find it surprising but quite natural that my strength and what I love to do is somebody else's weakness and something they hate to do and vice versa. So if you look hard enough and get to know people in your workplace, you're bound to find people that you can partner up with and help one another to be more successful by capitalising on each other's strengths. This also requires us to appreciate and respect people who bring different strengths to the table. 
what we actually naturally like is to work with people who are the same as us because it's easy. But what we probably need to do is work with people who are different to us. So if I'm one of those people who pushes the lift button um, a lot of times to remind the elevator that I'm there, chances are high that I might be an activator, which is somebody who likes to spring into action and get things done. My worst nightmare might be being somebody, being partnered with somebody who's deliberative. These are the people who are very thoughtful, they weigh up options, they're calculated, they think a lot before they move forward. These two types of people might hate the idea of being put together on a team or a partnership, but what a beautiful match when you put together somebody who's, who's thoughtful and strategic and deliberates, but somebody who's actually going to spring forward and make it happen with energy. So it may take some time for us to get really comfortable working with people who are quite different to us, uh, but it's very effective once we do. In all situations, find a way to use and invest in developing your strengths. So we've all taken our raw talents and we've developed them into strengths, but there's plenty of room for improvement still. You can never stop improving and building upon your strengths. Some ideas I have that you might like to do in your, in your spare time. Uh, online education, getting a coach or a mentor, which many of you might have. Developing a buddy system. This is when you might, kind of a variation on the, the coach or mentor, where you might get together with a bunch of people your age and similar stage in career, perhaps once a month and you all get together for lunch, say on Friday, and you talk about where you're at in your career, where you'd like to go, are you utilising your strengths and your weaknesses, you hold each other accountable and listen to one another. This can really help with the development. Can, one, I, can I suggest you add one line to that? Sorry. Yes. You know, the secret to all that is yes. that you allocate yes. time to oh, do okay. it. Eh? Yeah. People don't allocate time to do it. They don't allocate time to themselves. Mm -hmm. If you look in your calendar, you've allocated time to everybody else, but not to yourself. Mm -hmm. so you set aside 15 minutes or half an hour every day, and I'm going to do something for me. Mm -hmm. then, it be, then it will happen. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens unless you allocate time to it. Right? It's very key learning here. If you want to improve yourself, allocate time to it. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great point. And I think we're allocating time, this part of this time can be spent understanding our strengths. And you have a whole diary in front of you of people ring up and you give, give it away to people. Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to have some time on my own. Right. That I would make a difference between being average and being good. Because I think when we give ourselves time, and it might be time that we're thinking, we feel like we're not productive. But thinking time, when we're thinking how do we develop ourselves, how do we apply strengths is very productive and we absolutely do need to make time for it. The final thing I suggest is, is joining a, a club. I have a, a colleague who is the most fabulous presenter and facilitator you will ever meet. She has communication as one of her top strengths, but she says, you know, I didn't just roll out of bed and get here and be this fantastic. I spent many years doing things like going to Toastmasters. So volunteer work, joining a club, uh, doesn't have to be something expensive or necessarily time consuming. But once you know what your strengths are, figure out a way where you can get to practice them in a safe environment and, and take them from a strength to something that makes you truly exceptional or unique, perhaps one of the best in New Zealand or world class at what you do. Just four final points to summarise. Recognise your strengths, build on them, find the right opportunity and environment to use them in. So find a place where your strengths will be appreciated. And finally, something that we don't do enough of in New Zealand, be proud of your strengths. Your strengths are what makes you unique. You will never meet anybody in the world who has the same top five strengths 
in the same order as you, the chance is something like 1 in 33 million. So be, be proud of them, own them, understand them, uh, put them into action in your, in your work life, and from there uh, I would be very confident of uh, success and fulfillment in your career. So with that, I would say thank you for listening and for participating in my exercises. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Can we please give Ashley a round of applause.